Um, my name is Lucia Lari. I'm a PhD student in Neil Johnson's lab. Um, I study physics of complex systems. That's just really a fancy way of saying we're looking at objects and we want to see how they're changing and evolving in time. Um, so the talk, the title of my talk today is actually Distrust is Now Global and What to Do About It. And these are going to be based off of a paper that we recently published, but some of the results are going to be updated. It took a bit <laughs> to edit that paper to get published. So the data for that one, we've technically been collecting the data for the Facebook system since 2018. The specific data we were focusing on this one was from May 2022 to October 2022. Some of the updated results take that to October 2023. Um, I do want to push back a little bit because this section was trust in an infodemic and on the draft, this talk was also, uh, you know, building trust in a social media network. And I want to push back a little bit on that because we're really studying how to combat distrust, which is not building trust per se. You know, distrust is this spectrum and it ranges from science skepticism and it goes all the way to outright myths and disinformation. And what we're really interested in looking at is um, analyzing the dynamics of that spectrum of distrust and investigating how to disrupt its resilience. So not building trust per se, but potentially opening the space for trust building exercises. So what you're seeing on here is only a small subset of our data. For the Facebook pages, some of them in their usernames mention locations. So you can go through that data and you can find the longitude and the latitude, and then you can go ahead and put a little pin, and that's where the community is. Now I wanna point out, okay, <laughs> There we go. Um, we do have France. We have almost 20 communities in France. The problem is their usernames are not specific. So you look at America and you're like, the US has a whole lot going on here. Why is France just this one spot that looks like it's sort of self-referential or self-looping in on itself? It's because these pages are saying something like vaccine information for French parents. They're not specifically saying like, for parents in Paris or something like this, whereas um, a lot of the pages in the United States are being really specific. They might mention even a neighborhood, which is how granular sometimes it gets. So, um, you know, we have discussed at length that distrust of health expertise is this growing threat and you know there have been a lot of different mitigation campaigns to try and combat this we've had government campaigns the uk's don't feed the beast we have independent fact checkers like full fact we have public health groups that are pushing social uh, media for more effective content moderation but the problem is we still really have this problem of distrust so we need to start asking ourselves where are we going wrong with these mitigation schemes? And we start thinking, well, we're kind of siloing ourselves. If we have my abortion page that's focusing on a specific city, or maybe I'm focusing on a specific county, if I'm focusing on a specific state, a specific country, we might even be siloing ourselves on what topic we're discussing. Maybe I'm only focusing COVID-19, maybe I'm only focusing on vaccinations. So we need to start thinking to ourselves, is this sort of siloed thinking the way to approach this complex problem? You know, do we think these narratives operate in isolation or do we think distrust of one might reinforce distrust of others. So really, our proposal here is that you need to have system level interventions that resonate across multiple topics and multiple geographical scales. And this is why we say public messaging will be more effective if it becomes global. It needs to blend on these different scales. Now, um, there's this preprint by Jennifer Allen. If you want the title of the preprint, I can give it to you later. But it had some very interesting results. They were also looking at Facebook system where, um, yes, looking at misinformation directly is harmful, but they found that 
science skeptical content had a much greater reach. And I want to bring attention specifically to this one. Being vaccinated does not prevent an individual from contracting or transmitting COVID-19, New York State Supreme Court. This, we know, is you know, technically true. It's factual. And it's getting back to this point of understanding gist yesterday. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but there is a comment from a person who says, interesting, because that was the tagline that they used to scare every single person who got the toxic jab. So many injured lifetime of illness. And um, I apologize, it's really small. It's the lies that people fell for. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't read it from this side. So we're really seeing that, how do you combat this? How do you combat what is technically a factual statement? And how do you combat what people are understanding from that? So um, first, I want to talk about what makes our data stand out from other people that are doing similar studies with Facebook. First, um, our data is an extension off of what was already published in 2020. Uh, what we've done now is we've extended the categories for neutral category. So what it is, is the data has pro-vaccine communities, anti-vaccine communities, and neutral communities. And we've extended it so that there are 12 neutral categories. And these categories are based off of self-identification. You have parenting pages, they're discussing cloth nappies, you know, feeding their babies, breast milk, that sort of thing. They're identifying as communities for parents, pet communities. So there's a whole bunch of them, organic eating, chemtrails, fluoride, um, marijuana, <laughs> things like this. So um, the thing is, other studies use third party black box tools like CrowdTangle. And there's kind of a question there because the, that hasn't really been rigorously scientifically proven for the accuracy. There's also a question there for Facebook's internal policies. There's also a problem of when you're using that data, it's a mention network. What do I mean by that? I mean, when you are a moderator and you're making a post on the page, you might mention another page and then that's a URL, but that's a fleeting connection. It's really not, obvious and there's really no guarantee that that's a meaningful connection between these two pages. Whereas for our data, what we're using is we're using it based off of the definition of communities built into Facebook itself. So it's a page that likes another page. Page A, pet communities likes this anti-vaccination community. Now page A, that pet community is getting anti-vaccination information on its feed. It represents an enduring conduit of information and it's just not clear that mention networks are really capturing that persistent tie. It's also just not technically clear how you would build our network from using these third party tools. Um, so what we're doing is we're leveraging Facebook's community structure. Now, um, we can go into this in more detail if you really want. I won't go into the full specifics, <laughs> but basically for collecting our data, we search up a whole bunch of vaccine related terms. We find pro and anti vaccination pages. We go through, we look at who they're following. We prune that for uh, what we think are meaningful pages. If a page, if a pet page is following anti-vaccination and they're posting about vaccines, we say this is important for looking at the vaccine ecosystem on Facebook. If they're also following the jets, we don't really think the jets are so important for the vaccine ecosystem. That point, we, we did that three times. And what ended up happening was we ended up coming back in on those pages that we started out with. So then we have three experts, um, subject matter experts, and they end up going through, they look through the posts, they look at the bio, they look at what they're saying on these pages, and they identify if the pages are pro, neutral, anti-vax. Then we get our final data set. So you get a list of communities and you get the list of connections between them. From that point, because we know the list of communities, we can just sit there and watch them and collect their posts. 
and we might decide, well, I want to look at lit different topics, and you might decide in March 2020, hey, I have this vaccine ecosystem, this COVID thing is getting really interesting. So you're looking at how people are censoring their conversations, they're like Wuhan bat flu, and you throw that into the filter. You also look at how they're censoring things for MPOX, one of the things was people kept using the monkey emoji, monkey, vax, vixed, jibbed, jabbed, every other combination you can think of for how people would like to rewrite facts. So you can create all these different filters and you might be interested in other topics outside of that. So for this study, we were looking at five topics, COVID-19, MPOX, abortion, elections, and climate change. Now, um, this up here, you could imagine that you find a pro page that's discussing COVID-19 and it is being followed by this other pro page. That's why it's highlighted in yellow. But the thing is, this pro page wasn't found to be discussing COVID-19, but it is technically getting that information. So you can split the network in two. You can think of it as broadcasters who are broadcasting the content, and you can think of receivers who are just quietly listening in on this conversation. So, you know, it's obvious and expected that in this you're going to get a hardcore group of anti-pages and you're going to get pro-vaccination pages. But actually, in our data set, almost 50% of the pages are neutral communities. And these aren't people that are looking at sort of crazy health ideas. They're worried about what's in their water. They're worried about poultry farming. They're worried about organic and healthy eating. So what it's happening is with this network, with 50% of it being these neutral communities, they're being pulled in. They're being entangled with these pros and anti-vaccination pages. And this is the way that distrust can be built in the system. Now, I know there's a lot to look at here. So let me walk you through it first. This is the initial system. Now, a dot means a community, and the lines between them are the connections. That is how the information can flow through the community. Um, if you want to talk about the details about the layout for the network, we can go into this. I, but I will tell you it's a physical layout, and what the implications for the physical layout mean is when you see the clustering, this means that these are communities that are more likely to share information with each other. They're more likely to interact with each other. So I want you to know, reds are antis, and on the other side are pros. I think we could expect this. But all these other different colors are the different neutral communities. So this is the starting point of the ecosystem before COVID-19. However, we go here, and I want to say before November 2020, Facebook was focusing on putting these information banners on the different uh, anti-vax communities, and they were focusing in on that gray circle. So they were focusing in on that gray circle. And after this point in November 2020, they're like, OK, we cannot keep doing the information banners. We are going to start deleting these pages. We are going to start deleting these pages, and it's not quite clear if they were going for pages based off of how many followers they had or some other um, network measures. But despite that, um, we can look at the system, at how it recovered at two different points. So this was the original one in the paper that was published in October 2023. I will say it was the beginning of the month, so it was not yesterday. I was not furiously <laughs> updating these slides. But these circles here are so you can track how the system has been tightened and pulled in. And I want you to see how these neutral communities are getting pulled in and tightened with these anti-vax communities. I also want you to see that despite the fact that Facebook was focusing on deleting and removing some of these more furiously posting anti-vaccination pages, the overall structure of the system has been maintained. So um, this one is getting a little more into the weeds. So when I was talking about the five topics, this is when the five topics really come into play. Not every community in this system is going to care about posting about climate change or abortion or about elections. 
So the system you see here are just those communities that were posting about at least one of the topics. And I want to point out the two ones that I find very interesting. Um, this is our fluoride groups. This is our chemtrail groups. They're non-COVID related conspiracies. So they were at one point discussing vaccinations, but now they're discussing elections. They're discussing abortion. They're discussing climate change. And this one, especially, I want to point out illness. If we look at what illness is discussing predominantly, it's climate change. So, you know, if you go to these communities, and I need to remind you that these identifications, illness, this is because they self-identify as illness communities. What does that mean? They're posting about cancer, they're posting about chronic illnesses. So you could technically go and you could just say, Facebook, give me all the pages that talk about chronic illness or fibromyalgia or something like this. And you could go and you could say, you know, I want to combat medical distrust. But the thing is, they're discussing distrust about climate change. They're engaged in these discussions on climate change. So you go in with all the money in the world discussing about medical distrust, and they're like, and now we're discussing climate change. And really, distrust of climate change is distrust against authorities. So you come in, and they have these set opinions about illness, and they're just not going to be listening to what you're saying. Um, so I did mention at the beginning that we wanted to have a global focus, and that is kind of vague what it means when we're talking about topics. I think it's very intuitive what we mean when we say geographically something could be global or local, but for local geographically, we mean they mention a location in the username and global as if they don't. But topically, what we mean is... Um, you can have a page that is, you can gather all your pages and all your communities that are discussing COVID-19. And in a sense, you have a global community of communities that are discussing COVID-19. You could also, however, because of the way our topic filters work, you could say, well, I'm actually interested in those pages that are discussing only COVID and climate change. So you can look at that and that's a very narrow topic focus and that is what we want to call a local topic focus and the thing is when you think about this question you ask yourself well how do i discuss this how do i make sense of what a global or a local topic is so we turned to end venn diagrams they're related to Venn diagrams. You have your traditional Venn diagram. There are problems with Venn diagrams though because you know the area of the circle is not proportional to the number of communities. Also imagine in your head a four circle Venn diagram, a five circle Venn diagram. You go above that just because of the nature of Venn diagrams. You can't actually represent all the overlaps. So an N Venn diagram, the circles are proportional it also allows us, if you look at this blue outline, that then becomes your global community of pages discussing COVID-19. But then if you look into this, this is proportional, you get a sense of those pages that are discussing specifically and only COVID-19. So that allows you to start disentangling how the different topics are feeding into each other and how they're evolving. Now this, Next slide is going to be a lot. <laughs> I know. If I am not going to talk about everything here, if you would like to, we can. I will also say this is not in the paper. This is updated. So it's been updated to October 2023. But um, what we, let me explain first what we're seeing here. So we have five topics, and we could see if you tried doing this with a Venn diagram, it would be nonsense. But um, the circles only have a label if 3% or more of the population of communities were in that circle discussing it. And we've split it out by global communities geographically, and we split it out by local communities geographically. Now, these colors mean that this 
local topic is dominated by neutral anti-vax. You might notice that there is one color missing from all the labels, and that is blue, pro-vaccine. And actually, if you look at it, these smaller circles, let me remind you that that is less than 3% of the communities. For global communities, only six of those circles would be dominated by pro-vaccination only if you remove neutral community. When you look at local communities, only three of those circles are dominated by pro-vaccination. And again, you have to remove neutral communities from this. There is no topic here that is being dominated by pro-vaccination communities. It's all neutral and it's all anti-vaccination. Now, I also want to point out um, these results are slightly different just because the system is changing in time. So back in October 2022, there was something like, I think this circle had 50 pages. It was, it was much larger. It's shrunk a bit, but it's still the dominant two topic local. Now, what is this one? Because if you don't look at this as much as I do, it might be hard to tell. This is the overlap of COVID and climate change. And then for local communities, the overlap, the most popular two topic overlap is elections and climate change. Now, why do I bring this up? You could focus on messaging that's only climate change. You could focus on message that's only on COVID-19. There are certainly communities that are still stuck on talking about COVID-19 in October, 2023. Um, and it's a real pie in the sky because this circle here and this circle here are those communities that are discussing all five topics. I think it would be real pie in the sky if I told you, you need to make your messaging campaigns discuss every possible topic. It's just not possible. But what you can do is you can start looking at what's related, what topics are people most interested in discussing, and what topics are they most interested in discussing together. And they're really interested in discussing COVID and, and climate change together. Now that value has gone down a little bit since October 2022, but it's still the most popular two topic, and it was the most popular two topic back then. So there's clearly a hold that this particular combination of topics has on people. Um, I forgot to mention what these values at the bottom was, and I apologize. So each page has followers. They have a fan count. And so obviously you can just add up and you could see how many people are in, are in those circles, not just by pages, but what is the reach here? Who is it actually reaching? Um, I don't want to get too much into this one. We can talk about the simulations in detail if you want to. It's just we've performed some simulations looking at this data, and we really wanted to see what was the resilience of the system when you were targeting these different local scales. And this is the result for if you were targeting that geographical local scale. And you're like, what is, what is this line? So you might have the idea, you might say, well, I, 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 I really care about my hometown. I really care about combating, you know, anti-choice sentiments. I want to do abortion um, messaging and I want to focus on my hometown. Now, if you go and you do this very localized messaging campaigning, um, the problem is for that science skeptical content, you need to have a less than a 2% chance of the pages reactivating to actually do anything effectively if you are focused on this really hyper-local thing. So people that are like, well, I really care about my community and I really care about combating anti-choice sentiment. You know, I don't want to diminish how important the messaging is, but I do want to point out that in this system, it's just not having an effect. You, like, you have to have less than a 2% chance of reactivation. That's just not realistic. 
So you need to start going up. You need to start going up either on topical scales or you need to start going up on geographical scales. And we have another simulation. Um, I didn't include it. <laughs> I wanted to spare you all the details, but if you're curious, we can talk about it. Um, but that's basically it. <laughs> Um, so really the outcomes were we were looking at distrust in the Facebook vaccine ecosystem. We were finding that it blends both topics and geographical scales and that because of this interconnectivity, it's really resistant to mitigations. And also the system was really resistant to Facebook's own if no deletions. We say to ourselves, well, why don't we just get rid of the anti-fax pages? That's really not going to do anything. There's still a resilient core to the system that is going to survive despite that. So you need to get smarter about it. So, and our proposal to that is because it's resilient along topic and geographical scales, your messaging needs to also take that into account. Thank you. <laughs>